you know, still be able to see her right and everything. Okay. Yeah, that shows up better. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit. I'm going to give you a little bit of background information first. I have, uh, I printed out some of the slides. Uh, these are the important ones, but uh, here in the beginning, I'm going to go through a little bit of, of the background information, a little bit about the instrument itself. I will not test you on that. So what's important is once we get to the handout there, the slides that I, ha that I printed out. So when we make a new compound in the organic lab, um, if we're doing research, we make a brand new compound that's never been made before. Uh, there are several things that we have to do uh, to determine the structure of our unknown compound. The, one of the things that we can do is mass spectroscopy, and we, we've talked about the mass spec a few weeks ago. My spec gives us a little bit of information. It tells us uh, some of the uh, fragments of the molecule. We know a few of the pieces. We'll know if there was a methyl group or an ethyl group. You know a few of the pieces like that. Uh, you can get the molecular weight of your compound. And that's about it from my spec. So you know a little bit. IR, we can get functional groups from IR spectroscopy. That helps. So you'll know if you have an OH group or a carbonyl group, but you don't know which one. <clears throat> so you know a little bit. We've talked about UV vis spectroscopy in lecture. That tells you a little bit of something about the conjugation within the molecule. So you'll know how how much conjugate look kind of an idea of how much conjugation you have. But again, you have no idea of what the actual structure is. NMR will tell you the exact structure of your molecule. So it gives us a lot more information. Now it's a lot more difficult to interpret the spectra because it does give us so much information. So as an organic chemist, when we make a new compound, we don't rely on just one of these. Yes, NMR is the best, but we don't rely on just NMR. We do all of these, and if all of these are indicating that this is the molecule, then we can reasonably say that we are certain that this is our structure. So those other mass spec and IR and all those, those help confirm the structure. But the most information we get is from NMR, but we will use all of those. Now all of these techniques only use just milligrams. We don't need much material. NMR is, uh, it is non-destructive to our sample, so we can recover our sample, which is great since uh, I told you MRI is based on the same principle. You'd hate to destroy your sample, destroy your patient. So you do get your uh, sample back, you get your patient back when it's over with. Um, we've seen with IR, we can recover on IR. We normally don't, but we could. We could scrape it off there on the top when you take your IR spectrum. You could get that back. The sample was not hurt. Uh, UV-Vis, same thing. It's not hurt. You can get your sample back. Um, so all of those techniques, you get it back except for mass spec. Mass spec destroys the sample because we fragment it into all these pieces and and we don't get it back in my spec. My spec's the only one that we don't recover the sample. So if you didn't have much sample, sometimes we only make, maybe only make a few milligrams. We want to run my spec last. Run all the others because you can recover your sample and save the my spec for last. Okay, so we use combination of all of those. That's just more of the same thing. Now, let's talk a little bit about where we're looking at within the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so we have talked about UV vis. That's your UV vis region. There's your IR is your infrared. That's where we're looking at next. Uh, so IR gives you information about the stretching and the vibrations within the bond, stretching and bending. 
there is an instrument that looks in the microwave region, uh, but we don't cover that here in this class. The NMR operates with radio waves. We use radio waves as our energy source. So depending on what our energy source is, we get different information about the molecule. <clears throat> now, by, if you recall back in general chemistry, you were taught that an electron has a spin associated with it. Uh, you were taught that the spin, you either have spin up or spin down. That's what you were taught. Uh, a nuclei also has a spin associated with it if you have the right isotope. So a nuclei also has a spin. Now that spin is randomly oriented in the absence of a magnetic field. And that's what I'm trying to show here. There is the spin and it's just completely random. Every, molecule, every atom is pointing in a different direction. However, if we take that and put it in a magnetic field, put it in a magnet, then the spins will align. They either align with the magnetic field. Here's our magnetic field down here. They either align with the field or against the field. But there is some type of alignment. You're either with it or against the field, but it's no longer random. Now one of these, these two are not the same energy. You can probably guess which one's higher in energy. It's higher in energy to oppose the magnetic field. It's lower in energy to, to line up with the magnetic field. So these are different energies. In the absence of the magnetic field, it doesn't matter which way they point, they're all the same energy. These are all the same energy. But when we get into a magnetic field, that spin, those are different now and they are different energies. Whether you're with the magnetic field or against it. So our NMR uses a magnet. It's got a big old magnet in there. Uh, your very best spectrometers use a superconducting magnet because you can get to an even stronger magnetic field. Um, we did have one here in the department and it broke, and plus it got too expensive to operate it anyway. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, but we have a new benchtop NMR. It's very small. Uh, it doesn't have as strong a magnet, but it still gives pretty good spectrum. I've been really pleased with how good a spectrum it gives for such a small instrument. Uh, you do get better spectra on a larger, uh, stronger magnet. Now, as I mentioned, those two spin states, whether you're aligned with the magnetic field or against it, they are different energies. So in the here I'm showing in the absence of a mag magnetic field, they're, they are the same energy. The spins are all the same. But in the magnetic field, whether you're aligned with it, that's lower energy than if you're against it. That's higher energy. Now the stronger the magnet that you have, the bigger this energy difference. So here is a 1.4 Tesla magnet, here's a 7 Tesla magnet, and you can see it's that larger magnet separates out gives you a bigger energy difference between the spin states. Now, that you might think that might cause us a problem. If we take a spectra on our little small NMR and somebody else takes a spectra on a big large NMR spectrometer, do we get a different spectrum? Well, we have a way to fix that. Yes, it would be different, but we have a way to fix that where they are the same on every instrument. And we'll talk just a little bit about that in a moment as well. Okay, this is a little, kind of a, just a little drawing of, of what one of these big magnetic, uh, with a big uh, superconducting magnet, what one of these NMR spectrometers looks like. Um, the big dome inside is the superconducting magnet. Now you know that our superconducting magnets, uh, all the superconducting magnets that are known are only superconducting at very low temperatures. Um, the highest temperature that is currently known uh, for a 
superconducting magnets is it's about I'm wanting to say about 80 80 Kelvin or so is the highest one that's known all the rest of it's got to be colder than that uh, to, to operate so the superconducting magnet that we have in the spectrometer actually sits in a bath of liquid helium same thing for your MRIs they have superconducting magnets in those instruments and that magnet sits in a bath of liquid helium liquid helium the temperature of liquid helium is 4 Kelvin very very cold now that liquid helium will boil away over time so that's the boiling point is 4 Kelvin and over time it boils away and you have to fill it back up helium is extremely expensive liquid helium runs uh, I think the current price right now is about um, I think it's about $60 a liter to help save on helium so you have a doer of liquid helium here that the magnet sits in. There's another doer that surrounds that that we put liquid nitrogen in. Liquid not temperature of liquid nitrogen is 77 Kelvin. And that helps save, it's not cold enough to keep the magnet superconducting, but it helps save on the liquid helium. Liquid nitrogen is very cheap. It's, it's, it's about a dollar per liter. And liquid helium is $60 per liter. So you can see that the cost savings there. The doer of liquid nitrogen, we have to replace the liquid nitrogen every week. It boils away and you have to fill it back up every week. The helium, you have to fill up about every three or four months. So, you know, that is really help saving. If we didn't have that liquid nitrogen around the helium there, you'd be filling helium every week. And $60 per liter, that gets really expensive, especially when you need 60 liters to fill it up and your MRIs you need even more. They're a bigger instrument. <clears throat> so these hospitals, you all want to go to med school and become a doctor. Most all these hospitals have at least two or three, maybe four MRI instruments and they really push the doctors to do an MRI on just about everybody that walks in the door because they're trying to recoup the cost to operate that instrument. They're running through so much liquid nitrogen, so much liquid helium. The instrument's very expensive to start with, and then they're just the upkeep of have, having to keep that filled up every week. Uh, runs into a huge amount of cost. Uh, and it keeps going higher and higher. Uh, helium has basically quadrupled in price in, say, the last say the last 10 years at least uh, it's, it's more than quadrupled in price in the last 10 years and that's because we will eventually run out of helium on the planet we can't make helium now where we get helium is where when we drill uh, when a new natural gas well is drilled helium being so light it comes off first you collect all the helium you can and then that well is done then the natural gas starts coming off so the helium comes off right at the very beginning. So when you first drill a well, you get the helium and then it's it's shot, it's done. You don't get any more, that's it. So the cost is really gonna go up right now because we have a Democrat in for president. Democrats are always against drilling. Uh, Republicans are drill baby drill. Uh, Republicans are more screw the environment uh, let's just keep energy low. Um, so cost jumped really high when Obama was in. Cost came down when Trump was in. Cost is going to go back up now because they're going to stop drilling new wells. Uh, they'll put a stop to that. So there'll be very little helium being produced. Uh, it's expected by about the year 2040 that there will be no more helium on the planet. Uh, so I don't know what they're going to do then. They need, they're going to have to get uh, superconducting magnets that will operate at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Right now there's only one that will operate at liquid nitrogen temperature and it's not, sta it's not a stable enough magnetic field to be used in an MRI or a NMR spectrometer. So we need something that will work at that temperature. 
Uh, so that will be a problem in your lifetime. You could become a doctor at some point. They're going to have problems with MRIs. We're going to run out of helium. It, uh, many of the scientists are pushing governments to outlaw the use of helium for any other purposes other than scientific purposes. Uh, and I agree with that. I think they need to outlaw that. We don't need birthday balloons. and Especially you watch the uh, Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. You got big Snoopy going down the street, you know, full of helium. I'm like, oh man, look at all that wasted helium. And uh, like I said, once it's gone, it's gone. Okay, anyway, so we have the magnet inside sitting in that liquid helium and then liquid nitrogen around that. Uh, everything is hooked to, it's hooked, this is the, would be the spectrometer and then the spectrometer itself is hooked to a computer. So the spectrometer is telling the magnet what to do and everything, sending the radio uh, waves, the radio frequency waves and everything. The sample goes down here in the center Right here is where the sample, we put the sample in. Uh, these small tubes is where you fill the nitrogen and the big tubes is where you fill the helium in. But your sample goes right in the middle. Uh, your MRI is basically the only, differ only difference is this sits on its side and you slide the sample in horizontally instead of vertical. And like I said, of course, the MRI is much, much bigger. You gotta be able to get a person on the inside. Now with your NMR, inside these, we're gonna spin the sample to get a more homogeneous uh, mixture there. Um, in your MRIs, you don't want to spin the sample. We're sp here we're spinning in about uh, 20 to 30 uh, revolutions per minute. Uh, we don't want to spin the sample that fast in an MRI. So what they do is they turn the magnet around the person. The person stays still and the magnet rotates around the person with your MRIs. Just a small difference. Now. So I mentioned that there's a spin associated with our nuclei, and we're gonna be looking at protons. That's what we're gonna look at here first. And your MRI is looking at the same thing. Your body's mostly water, so it's looking at protons of the water that's in your body. Uh, and, and, and you'll get spectra whether the protons are next to healthy cells or next to cancerous cells or that type of thing. You get a different, a different essentially peak. We don't see peaks in the MRI. Doctors want to see an image rather than peaks. Chemists want to see peaks. But anyway, this spin is uh, precessing around uh, the z-axis. We hit it with a radio frequency pulse. Just boom. Shoot all this radio frequency at it. We shoot a wide range of radio frequencies. We hit it with everything we got. We don't know what the molecule wants, what each hydrogen, what it wants. We just hit it with everything we got. Each hydrogen will absorb whatever energy it wants from that. And it will go from that lower energy spin state up to the higher. So what that is, that spin has to flip. So it was precessing around the Z axis and that spin gets flipped and now it's going around the X, Y plane. So it flips that spin. Now. Over time, it wants to go back to that lower energy spin state. Right now, it's in a high energy. It absorbed all that radio frequency and it's in a high energy. Spin got flipped. It wants to go back to where it went, low energy. So over time, it will fall back. As it does, it gives off the energy that it absorbed. And we call that an FID. It's, it, the, the detector is picking up that energy that it's giving off it gives off a lot in the beginning, and then as it gets closer and closer back to the z-axis, it gets smaller and smaller. It's not giving off as much energy then. So we call that an FID, free induction decay. That's just where it's falling back to its original spin state. And our detector is picking that up. So it didn't, we didn't know what energy it needed, so we just throw everything at it, and then we measure what it gives off. Then we know what it wanted, which energies it wanted which frequencies. Now our computer does, takes this FID, it does a Fourier transform on that, that's just a mathematical manipulation, and we get the peaks that we're used to seeing, it, just like any other spectrum. Chemists always want to see peaks. So that's basically how the NMR spectrometer works. Here's a picture of uh, 
one of these spectrometers. I just grabbed this off the internet. So this is like a 400 megahertz NMR spectrometer and the magnet would be right here in the center of that. Uh, I didn't, I meant to put in a picture, I didn't. I didn't put a picture. We, I'm gonna put in a picture of our little benchtop NMR. So this is like a 400 megahertz that's using the superconductor. Ours, it does not have a, our new one instrument does not have a superconducting magnet, just the old standard magnets, old standard static magnets. Um, ours is operating at 60 megahertz, but still gives some pretty good spectrum. For 60 megahertz, it's still amazing at the spectrum that it gives off. Uh, this is just another picture of just what I just said there. So again, it was precessing around the z-axis that spin was, and then we hit it with the radio frequency pulse that flips the spin over to the xy plane. Now it's precessing around the xy plane, and over time it will relax back to to the z-axis, and as it does, it's giving off that energy, and that's what our detector picks up. Now, here's where your handout where the slides start. So all this up to this point, this is just a little background about how the instrument works. <clears throat> I will not test you on that. Here's where we get into the important stuff. Now, we can take an NMR of almost any element on the periodic table if we have the right isotope. The the nuclei that we are looking at must have a spin quantum number and a spin quantum number of one half will show up in the NMR. So some atoms that have a spin quantum number of one half, a proton does, and we are going to be talking about proton NMR, has a spin one half. That means you have two spin states. You either have plus one half or minus one half. We need those two spin states, and that's what we're looking at, the energy difference between those. Uh, some other atoms that we might be interested in, carbon-13, we are going to talk about it. Carbon-13 also has a spin one half. Uh, fluorine-19, phosphorus-31, those isotopes do have spin one half, and they will, can, they will show up in the NMR. We can see peaks for those. Some that do not, carbon-12, spin quantum number is zero. There are no spin states for that. So carbon-12 will not show up in the NMR. Carbon-13 does. Um, oxygen-16 does not. Uh, Sulfur-32. What you need is an isotope with an odd number, mass unit. So proton-13, 19, 31, any of the odds show up. Evens do not. That's the easy way to remember it. So if you're trying to figure out which isotope you need, odds show up in NMR, even ones do not. Now, I'm going to have you add one more to this list. So we saw we're going to be looking at carbon. Carbon 13 will show up, carbon 12 will not. Protons will show up. The isotope of a proton will not. What's the isotope of a hydrogen, of a proton? What's it called? Deuterium. I'm sorry? Deuterium. Deuterium. Deuterium will not show up. So add deuterium to this list. Deuterium, mass of two. It's got a mass of two, so that's an even number. It will not show up. So add deuterium to that list. Deuterium will not show up in the NMR. And that's actually going to be important. Remember that, that deuterium does not show up. <clears throat> okay, so our NMR is going to give us a spectrum that's going to have all these different peaks, and those peaks are corresponding to the different hydrogens within our molecule, the different protons. This is a typical looking spectrum uh, for proton NMR. Uh, we typically, you're, you're, it looks like it's printed backwards, but it has to do with the frequency that we're using. Uh, this, is, this is 
the high field end, this is the low field end. But in it, when we plot this, we plot it in parts per million rather than the field. We plot it in parts per million, and I'll tell you why we do that in just a moment. But uh, this is parts per million, ppm, so that switches the numbers, but it's, this is still the high field end, and this is the low field end. This is upfield, this is downfield. Um, so we normally scan a little bit below zero ppm. We'll go up probably to about 12 ppm or so, something like that. This one only went to a little bit past eight, but normally scan to about 12 uh, ppm, parts per million. That's your x-axis is always in parts per million. Uh, y-axis, we don't show a y-axis. The intensity of the peaks means absolutely nothing. It does not matter how tall the peaks are. So we just don't give a y-axis. The heights of these does not matter. Uh, there's things that can change the heights. Uh, and so you run it one time, it may be a real tall peak. You run it next time, it may be broadened out and shorter. So uh, we don't even consider the height of a peak. Okay, so you can see we got some peaks here. Uh, some of these have, you, the computer can expand this so you can get a little bit better view. See, so it's kind of hard to see this, but you, if the computer can expand it. You can see it's actually, this, this signal here is actually three lines. And this blue signal, if you expand it where you can see it a little bit better, it's actually four lines. And that's going to mean something to us coming up here. Okay, so that's just a typical spectrum. Now, when we do, when we take a spectrum, we need to be in solution. It makes the spectrum much easier to, uh, to take and to interpret if you're in solution. You can do solid state NMR where you have a solid, but it's much, much, much more difficult. You have to be a real NMR expert to be able to do that. And uh, everything just, it simplifies things to be in solution where the molecule can freely rotate. Now, our solvents, we want to be dissolved. The solvent, the NMR solvent that you're going to use, must not contain hydrogen. Otherwise, if we're doing proton NMR and our solvent has hydrogen, there's going to be more solvent in there than there is your compound. And every hydrogen would give a peak. And so those solvent peaks would be so big you wouldn't even notice the peaks belonging to your sample. So you want your solvent not to contain hydrogen atoms. Now, can you think of a solvent, an organic solvent? Organic solvents typically dissolve organic compounds. Can you think of an organic solvent that does not have hydrogen? Any thoughts? Because hydrogen give, that would give too big of a peak. Solvent would have big old huge peaks, and your compound would your, doesn't have much compound in there. Mostly solvent. Your compound just have little tiny peaks compared to the solvent. So I don't want my solvent to have hydrogens. Don't want my solvent to show up in the spectrum. So there you go. Exactly. Use a solvent, an organic solvent that's got deuteriums instead of hydrogens, then it doesn't show up. Exactly. If you're looking at my sheet there, you can see that. <laughs> so, some common solvents. Uh, this is deuterated chloroform. That's probably the most commonly used one. This would be deuterated benzene, uh, deuterated methanol. And deuterated acetone. Those are the, probably the four most commonly used solvents in organic. If you have some inorganic compounds that you want to take spectra of, you can use deuterated water. But you rarely does water dissolve an organic compound. Uh, so normally we need some type of organic solvent. Deuterated chloroform is the most commonly used one out of all these. Any thoughts on why it would be the most commonly used one? Why most people would use chloroform? Because it's 
do the rated chloroform. Anybody have a guess? Common sense type of question here. It's cheap, exactly. It's the cheapest one of the bunch. You, you might can guess that. You can see it's got less deuteriums. The more deuterium you've got, typically the more expensive it's going to be. So it's the cheapest of the solvents that I have here. So everybody uses most always going to try deuterated chloroform because it's the cheapest. It's still very expensive. Any of the deuterated solvents are very expensive, but this is by far the cheapest one. Um, give you an idea of the cost a uh, hundred milliliter bottle that's just a little tiny bottle 100 milliliter be about that big around about that tall that runs about hundred eighty dollars that sounds like a lot but it's really not um, we only need a half a milliliter to run an NMR spectrum so that hundred milliliter bottle is going to do us at least 200 samples. So that bottle, you know, per sample, we're spending about a dollar each time we run a sample for solvent, basically. So that's not too bad. <clears throat> okay, so that's important. We need a deuterated solvent. Now, I mentioned a little bit about the x axis there a moment ago. The x axis is always in parts per million. Now your, your chemical shift there, shift is where, it's called chemical shift, where the proton comes. If you're thinking about radio frequency, remember we're hitting this with radio frequency waves, you're thinking about radio frequency, you're usually t talking about hertz. So why are we not plotting this in hertz? Why is it parts per million? Well, different spectrometers are operating at different magnetic fields so we're using different radio frequency for for those and so it depends on the strength of your magnet you get the you know you saw you get a different energy difference there um, and I don't want my peaks to come at different places on a different instrument so what we do is take the peak that normally would be given in Hertz divide by the strength of the instrument which is in megahertz and then that gives us parts per million. So that if I'm running a spectra on our little 60 megahertz and we get a peak at, let's say, if we have a peak at 60 hertz, I divide by the strength of the instrument at 60 megahertz, which is 60 million hertz. Therefore, that's coming at one part per million. Now, if I go over to JSU, they have a 500 megahertz instrument that peak that we saw at 60 megahertz on our instrument would come at 500 megahertz on their instrument. So we divide by the strength of the instrument, 500 million hertz, it would come out at the exact same place, one part per million. So the, the computer does that for us. We don't have to do it. But that's why we plot these in parts per million. Then it doesn't matter what the strength of the instrument is because we're dividing by the strength of that instrument. And so our peaks are going to be at the same places if you go to JSU or Mississippi State or Ole Miss and use one of their instruments, our peaks will be at the same place. So that's why we use the parts per million. Now, your magnetic fields drift over time. They're never at exactly the same place. Our instrument, as I mentioned, is a 60 megahertz instrument, but that field is not always exactly 60 megahertz. Part of the time, maybe it's 59.998. And the next day you come in here and run it, and it's maybe 59.997. You know, it changes a little bit over time. So if I run a spectra today and come back a year later and take a spe another spectra of that same compound, I want my peaks to be in the same place. 
but over time that magnet's going to change. Especially the older the magnet gets, the more it's going to drift. And so we're going to use a reference compound so that the peaks will always be at the same place. We will always reference every peak. We're going to reference it to some compound that we know where the peaks come. And then that way that adjusts, that fixes any drifts that we happen to see. Now a long time ago, the reference compound was chosen to be TMS, tetramethylsilane. <clears throat> it was chosen for several reasons. One reason, it comes upfield enough that it doesn't interf interfere with any of our organic compounds, where our peaks come from organic compounds. TMS comes at zero parts per million. And so most all of our organic peaks, protons, are going to be like at 1 ppm or 2 ppm or 6 ppm, something like that, on downfield. And so this is up there out of the way. It's not going to cause us any problems with our peaks. It's not going to overlap anything. So that's one of the reasons it was chosen. Zero is a nice number, and it happens. this has happened to come just accidentally right at zero. Uh, some other reasons it was chosen... I already mentioned it's a higher field than most organic compounds. It's unreactive, very, very stable. We don't want a reference compound that would react with our sample. <clears throat> it's also non-toxic. You don't have to worry about poisoning yourself or anything. Uh, it's also very volatile and easy to remove. I mentioned before that we can recover our sample, but we've dissolved our sample in a solvent, and we're going to have this reference compound in there. So to recover your sample, you have to boil everything off. So we boil the solvent off, and also need to boil the reference compound off. And so it's got a very low boiling point, only 28, so it's very easy to boil away. Uh, just slightly above room temperature. So just put a little bit of heat to it and boil away. So that's some of the reasons for why we, TMS was chosen. So it was chosen a long time ago, <clears throat> back in the 1950s. That's when NMRs uh, first came out. I forgot to tell you a little bit about that on the instrument part when I was discussing it. So the first NMR spectra was taken in 1952. was the very first spectrum ever taken. And then by the uh, late 1950s then you could actually buy an instrument so I think it's about 1958 or 59 was the first instrument sold that you could buy by the 1970s then almost every school had an NMR instrument uh, they got down cheap enough that almost everybody had one uh, they're still expensive but they got down to where schools could afford them our little 60 megahertz, give you an idea, our little 60 megahertz instrument, that was $80,000, $82,000 that cost for that instrument. Uh, our, our old instrument that was the, we had a 400 megahertz that we shut down. A 400 megahertz nowadays, it will cost you about $400,000 for a 400 megahertz. They have them all the way up to over a gigahertz but those will run you about two and a half, three million dollars for one that size. And so basically the only schools that's got those are your Harvards and MITs, those schools uh, that's got them that strong. Okay, now here is getting into really important stuff now. So when we look at a spectra, there are several things, we're going to go through each of these separately. There are several things that are important when we look at a spectrum. The number of signals that we see gives us an indication of how many non-equivalent protons there are in a molecule. How many different kinds of protons that you have. The position on the x-axis, that's called the chemical shift, that tells us something about the environment that the proton is in. 
what's around that proton. Uh, I like to keep it related since most of you are pre-med, so with your MRIs, that's really, you know, what's around the proton is that hydrogen next to healthy cells or it is it next to cancerous cells. That's going to affect where that proton comes in the spectrum. So that's the, that position gives us some information about the environment that's around it. The area under the signal gives us uh, an estimate of how many protons are associated with that signal. How many protons are being measured there. So we're going to be talking about that. And then we're also going to be talking about multiplicity. That's uh, splitting. If you saw in that specter that I, gave, that I had up there a moment ago, the, the the example that I had, one of the signals was split into three lines, it had three lines, one of them had four lines. Those number of lines tells us what our neighbor looks like. So if we know what our neighbor looks like, and you go to it, and then look and see what its neighbor looks like, and then you go to it, and you look and see what its neighbor looks like, you start piecing the whole molecule together. So you can come up with the entire structure of the molecule. So we're going to look at all four of these individually here. So let's st start by looking at equivalent and non-equivalent protons. So I'm going to first go through this the way our textbook does. So in our textbook, in our lecture textbook, this is chapter 9 in our lecture textbook, if you go through their way, I'm going to show you their way, and then I'm going to show you my way. I think my way is easier. So let's, let's look at their way. So this is what they say. Uh, two or more protons that are in identical environments are said to have the same chemical shift. In other words, they're going to come at exactly the same place. If they are exactly in the same environment, then their position on the x-axis would be in exactly the same place. Now, that's, that's, that's good. That's true. <clears throat> Those are called chemically equivalent protons. If they're in exactly the same environment, they're called chemically equivalent. Or they're also called, referred to as chemical shift equivalent. Chemical shift is where you come on the x-axis. So they would be coming at the same place. So we call them chemical shift equivalent. Now, how do we tell whether something's equivalent or non-equivalent? This is how the book tells you to do it. So another way to, another some other terms for that, this means the exact same thing as homotopic and heterotopic. Uh, if your hydrogens are equivalent, they are said to be homotopic. If they're not equivalent, then they're called hetero heterotopic. So it's just another term. It means the exact same thing as equivalent or non-equivalent. So homotopic means you're equivalent, heterotopic means you're not equivalent. So this is the way the textbook does it. I think this is very confusing. So if you're trying to decide if two hydrogens are, are, are equivalent, or if they're homotopic, equivalent means homotopic, you're going to replace those hydrogens with some other atom and then examine what you have. If, if you replace each hydrogen with some other atom and you get the exact same thing, then those original hydrogens are said to be homotopic. They are equivalent. So let's take a look at that. Let's look at this molecule. I've got six hydrogens here in this molecule. Are those six hydrogens equivalent, homotopic, same thing, are they homotopic, are they equivalent, or are they not? So this is what the book says. Change each one of those to some other atom, like a bromine. So I'm going to replace this one with a bromine. I'm going to replace the next one with a bromine and work my way all the way around, replace each one of them with some other atom, doesn't matter what you use, I just happen to use a bromine, 
Okay, so I did all six of them. If you look, all six of those are the exact same molecule. This is bromoethane, that's bromoethane, 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 bromoethane. All six of them have got the same compound, replacing each of those hydrogens with the bromine. So what that's telling me is that the original six hydrogens are all equivalent. They were homotopic. All six of those are equivalent. That means all six of them will come at exactly the same place in our spectrum. Along the x-axis, the chemical shift, x-axis, they will all six come at exactly the same place because they are equivalent. Now, if we go through and replace each hydrogen and you get different compounds, then those are said to be non-equivalent hydrogens or heterotopic. So for example, let's use bromoethane as my example. Now, don't confuse this with the previous one I had up there. This is what we're taking a spectrum of now. Before I've taken a spectrum of ethane, here we're taking a spectrum, we're going to take a spectrum of bromoethane. Now there's five hydrogens here. Are those five hydrogens equivalent or are they some of them different? So I'm going to replace each of the five with some other atom. You could use any atom. I'm going to use a chlorine here. And let's replace all of those with a chlorine. Now if you do all of these on the methyl group, then you take a look. I have got all three of them are the same. That's 1-bromo-2-chloroethane, 1-bromo-2-chloroethane, 1-bromo-2-chloroethane. All three of them are the same. That tells me these three are equivalent. If you do the two on the other side, these, these two over here are also equivalent. They are homotopic. But these are different than those. Because if you switch, if you change one of these out, the green ones here, replace those with a chlorine. Now, this is a different molecule than we had over here. This is a 1-bromo-1-chloroethane. This is 1-bromo-2-chloroethane. This is a different molecule. That means this, these hydrogens are different than these hydrogens. These two are equivalent. These two are homotopic. These three are equivalent. They are homotopic. But these three are different than these two. These are heterotopic. And you can see that if you look at the structure. These two are on a carbon that has a bromine. These three are, are on a carbon that has another carbon coming off of it. They, they're in different environments. This is like these are next to a cancerous cell and these are much farther away from it. You know, that type of thing. So, there you can see it with the colored in. So the three purple ones are all equivalent. They will give one signal. And the two green ones are equivalent. They give one signal. But the green is different than the purple. Make sense? Questions? So this molecule will have two NMR signals because we've got two different kinds of hydrogen. Let's look at some other examples. Doing it the way the book does it, and I'll do it my way in just a moment. Here is the book way. You're going to switch each all those out with some other atom. You do like a bromine, switch them out, see what you get. And you'll see that these two green ones are equivalent, and these six purple ones are equivalent. But the green is different than the purple. This will have two NMR signals. Now, Switch going through and changing each one of them with some other atom. That's just very time consuming. This is the way I do them. I look for symmetry within the molecule. Symmetry can be a plane of symmetry or an axis of symmetry. Either one. If you have symmetry, then that makes the hydrogens on each side of your symmetry element equivalent. So if you look at this molecule here, 
there is symmetry. There's a plane of symmetry right down the center, here horizontally. That makes anything on the bottom equivalent with whatever is on the top. This hydrogen is equivalent with that one. These three are equivalent with those three because you have that plane of symmetry. That's a much easier way than having to change out every hydrogen with some other atom and then examine what you got. Just look for the symmetry elements. It can be a plane of symmetry or it can be an axis of symmetry. Let's look at another one. example. So if you look at this molecule, I think you can quickly see there is also a plane of symmetry in this one. You have a plane of symmetry horizontally. It makes everything at the bottom equivalent with whatever's at the top. This methyl is equivalent with this methyl. This hydrogen is equivalent with this hydrogen. Or is it because of that plane of symmetry? So this one has four different protons in it. Those two green ones are equivalent because of that plane of symmetry. These two green ones are equivalent. We said the two methyls are equivalent. So I've got those in purple. I guess that's pink. Sorry. That's my pink. I forgot I got a darker purple. We'll call that pink. This hydrogen is different than any of the others. I'll put that one in purple. And then the orange one is different yet still. Because we had a plane of symmetry through here that makes the bottom equivalent to the top, but there, there is no symmetry this way to make these the same. These are different because they don't have symmetry this way. So these are different. They're in different environments. I think you can see they're in different environments. This orange one sandwiched in between two methyl groups. This dark purple one is very far from the methyl groups. They're in different environments. So this one will have four NMR signals for the protons. <clears throat> this one here, if you're using my way of looking for symmetry, this does not have a plane of symmetry, but it has an axis of symmetry. I'm going to use this here as my axis. There's an axis of symmetry right here. If I rotate around this axis, rotate the molecule 180 degrees, you can see I get the exact same thing. So because of that axis of symmetry right through the middle, it makes this methyl equivalent with this methyl. Because if I rotate 180 degrees, I will have the exact same thing. By the way, that's called a C2 axis of symmetry. That axis of symmetry also makes this one equivalent with that one. It makes these two equivalent with these two. And if you rotate 180 degrees, these, that would bring these two down to here. It takes this one up to there. So those are equivalent. So this has got three different kinds of protons in it. We would have three signals. You've got the four green ones are all equivalent. Or homotopic, if you want to use that terminology. I just say equivalent. They will give one signal. And then you have the six pink ones, they give a signal. And then you have the two purple ones, they are equivalent, they give a signal. So we got three signals for this molecule. Now, I'm gonna test you here. Let's go through a few of these. I'm not gonna go through every single one of them. Uh, let's do A there real quick. How many different protons, how many signals will I see? You see a signal for every different proton, every different kind. Each one that's non-equivalent. So how many signals should I see there for A? Two. Two. You have symmetry within the molecule. That symmetry makes the two CH2s equivalent and the two CH3s equivalent. So the, the, the two CH2s, all four of those hydrogens are equivalent. They will give one signal. And then all six of the methyl hydrogens, they give one signal. So A will show two signals. How about B? Three. three. The CH3 gives a signal. Those three hydrogens are equivalent, but they're different than the CH2. CH2 gives a signal, those two hydrogens. 
and then the hydrogen on the oxygen. So it will give three. This was a hard one. Let's look at C. Look for symmetry. there. How many different hydrogens would there be for molecule C? How many signals should we see? Somebody says three back there in the back. Anybody got a different answer? Two. Two. Anybody got a different answer? Still haven't heard the right answer. Four. 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 Okay, there's four. How did I get four? Is there any symmetry in the molecule? No. So I think everybody will agree that the three hydrogens on the methyl, those are equivalent, but they're different than the hydrogens on the, on the double bond. I think everybody will agree with that. Now it comes, comes to the three hydrogens on the alkene, on the double bond. Are those equivalent or are they different? Well this one, on top here, this one is on a carbon that has a methyl. These are on a carbon that doesn't have a methyl. So you know this is different than those. Now, are these two equivalent? No. Remember you have restricted rotation around a double bond. You can't rotate around a double bond. So that's like cis and trans and that type of stuff. You know, we have the, we have the restricted rotation. So this hydrogen here is on the same side as another hydrogen. This hydrogen is on the same side as a methyl. These are different. run out cover so I'll put a triangle around that one. So there's four signals for that. You have the hydrogen on the methyl and then all three of those hydrogens on the double bond are all different. Okay, how about D here? That's pretty easy. That has a C2 axis of symmetry right through the middle. So that one has two. The two methyls are equivalent and then to the two CHs are equivalent because of the C2 axis. Uh, e, they're all different in E. So this will have three signals for the hydrogens. F is pretty straightforward. You have two signals for it. You have symmetry down the middle, makes the two methyls equivalent and the two CH2s equivalent, but of course CH2 is different than CH3. So that's got two signals. Uh, let's skip G for just a moment and let's do H. My camera's still going. Yep. Let me know when it quits, <laughs> if anybody happens to see it. Let's, uh, let me draw, a, well, let's think about this. Now, you've got two mouthfuls that are on wedges coming out. So that's like, like you've got, let's say if you had that cyclopropane ring, you've got two mouthfuls pointing up. This one does have symmetry down the center that makes the two mouthfuls equivalent. So if I have my two mouthfuls here, that's my markers. 